Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Some of you might know that we as Faraday host a series of interviews with some of the most important VCs in our ecosystem, not only in Spain, but also in Germany, obviously. So today I would like to welcome Alberto from Vaira, Germany, who I have a very close relationship with. So I'm very happy for him to, to be here today. Uh, Alberto, so how about you tell us a little bit about yourself first before we jump into the actual interview and our little discussion today. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so about myself, so I'm Alberto. I'm a Spanish guy living already uh, eight or nine years abroad. I studied business uh, in Spain and in uh, different countries in Europe. And then I decided to move to Munich, where I started my career in investment banking. And I started to work with the startups, helping them uh, doing fundraising, uh, fundraising projects and also uh, M&A &A projects. projects. Uh, after that, I co-built the Tech Founders, which is uh, a very important accelerator here in, in Munich, uh, part of the uh, Unternehmertum, which is the innovation center of the Technical University here in Munich. And uh, after two years here, I decided to, to test the corporate waters and started to work at Telefonica. And after a few, um, a few projects at Telefonica, I decided to move back to the startup side and started um, he, uh, leading the investments at Vaira. Cool. Thank you very much for that. So um, Vaira, for, for also the, the Spanish viewers, they probably know it more from, from Madrid, but Vaira, again, is a, an international uh, startup um, accelerator investor in, in, in many, many fields. So maybe you give us a little overview on um, how Vaira Germany actually evolved over time and what your current business model Uh, for Vira is in, in Germany. Sure. Yeah, so Telefonica has uh, different initiatives uh, to, to work and invest in the startups. Uh, one of them is Vira, which is focused on early stage startups and early stage investing. And then the other one um, is Telefonica Ventures or the new vehicle that is called Telefonica Tech Ventures that is uh, more focused on later stage startups, mainly on uh, network technologies and cybersecurity. Um, so WIDA uh, started in 2012 um, in, in Spain and, and in some other countries. And we started uh, being like a, like a startup ourselves, um, like learning by doing and, and working with the startups uh, as a normal accelerator. But we are still like we offered acceleration services. We invested in, in very early stage like Uh, real seed and pre-seed startups, so no, no product, only MVPs and prototypes. And uh, this was not really bringing a real impact to the core business of Telefonica. And, and that's why um, Telefonica decided in, in, at the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018 to change the business model, which is what we have today. And today uh, we work uh, with two streams. So there is one stream that is uh, focused on the relationship, the business relationship between the startups and the business units of Telefonica. So we look for startups that could work with Telefonica, first with a pilot project, with a POC, uh, with the goal that um, after the three months of the POC, the business units and the startups engage in a long-term uh, commercial relationship um and 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 not only locally but also globally so if they start working with germany the goal is that they end up working with telefonica in other countries and the second stream is uh the investment uh side so we are also uh the investment the early stage investment arm of telefonica and uh, yeah we're investing in the most promising startups um that that uh, go through the program or that we find on, uh, in our ecosystem. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, maybe because you're, you were already getting into this, the sort of what, what I think would be very interesting also for the, for the viewers is, you just mentioned it, so you invest into the most promising ones uh, that you have within the acceleration program or the POC program. Um, how is, is Vira Germany actually investing into these companies? Is it more of like a corporate venture capital firm? Is it a an actual fund that just has a financial means or what kind of startups are you looking for as well when you actually make an investment? Yeah, 
So we are investing directly from our balance sheet. Uh, and uh, we don't only invest in the startups that go through the program, but also uh, we can also invest in the startups that in the future could, could, work, could work with Telefonica. Um, in terms of focus, we are um, targeting many different technologies because uh, telcos right now are trying to yeah, find new, new revenue streams, working with new business models. Uh, so the, 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 the scope is endless, but we are trying to focus on big data, AI, network technologies, uh, cybersecurity. And with this tech focus, we uh, try to target lots of use cases in, in the segments of customer service, optimization, uh, HR tech, uh, and uh, retail tech. Um, we only co-invest. Uh, we don't take the lead because we we see as an strategic uh, strategic investor, and that's why our tickets are a bit uh, lower than 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 the the other investors. Uh, we invest normally uh, in late seed uh, and Series A startups with an average ticket of two hundred and fifty k. But at the end, what we want is to, to gain this commitment of the business units and the startups to work together and generate um, value for both parties at the same time. In terms, in terms of geography, we focus on, on the European continent here in Germany. But of course, we have offices in uh, Latin America as well. We have offices in, in, U, in, in UK and in Spain, as you said. So we have uh, kind of a global focus uh, or a global um, strategy, but in Germany we we try to focus on on the north part of Europe. Um, yeah, and um, I think that's it. So what we look for, maybe what what we look for in teams, uh, of course, a very very strong uh, management team. Uh, normally, like the best case, as you already know, or um, for our investors, it's normally the same thing: uh, three three people, three management members that uh, one of them knows the industry very well, the other one knows how to sell the product, and the third one knows how to build it. Um, we look for startups that have a functional product, so no MVP, they need to have already first revenues and first customers. And um, yeah, they should have a, a potential fit with Telefonica now or in the future. Very nice, thank you. Thank you for that little outline. I mean. Like you just said it as well, um, there's a lot of synergies and, and, and spaces where we coincide with what we look for in, in companies. Uh, as a matter of fact, with, with this, your Spanish branch, we, we already co-invested this, this Friday. And um, I'm very much looking for, we, we spoke about this last week, we spoke about two or three projects that could be very interesting that both you and, and us are looking into. So maybe we can have a first co-investment in, in Germany coming up soon as well. You never know. I'm looking... I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, so do I, so do I. Um, so obviously you said you, you're in a strategic investor for many of these startups who approach you as well, which is why you co-invest. Um, what, what would you say are the, what's, what's the value proposition that you actually offer those startups who want to work together with Vira, with Telefonica? And um, how can you sort of bring that message across to those, to those founders that they then actually want to work with you and how do you measure that? Yeah, um, so the, the main USP we have is that um, first we, we don't only bring cash, but also revenues. And we, only, we also bring speed, like we have direct access to the decision makers uh, in the different business units of Telefonica. So we can help the startups to skip all this uh, as well procurement process and, and long, uh, long sales cycles to get at least a first feedback for, from Telefonica and find out if, they sh if the startup should inv invest more time on this deal or not. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's very good for, for the startups in order to, to be efficient with their customers and opportunities. Uh, and also the second USP that we have is that we are a global network. So uh, if uh, one startup is successful in a local market, um, the, the chances of being successful in a global perspe perspective with Telefonica are quite high. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of internationalization, we, we can really help startups as well. And of course, our network of, um, of partners, um, of suppliers, of uh, investors, of uh, 
tech experts is always uh, very helpful for, for the startups. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe um, I can support this with, uh, with one more, like with some of the KPIs, because actually we are measured with, uh, with uh, KPIs that are impacting the startup. So for instance, um, the revenues, so one of our main KPIs is uh, uh, how many revenues are the startups generating with Telefonica per year. Mm -hmm. And last year, we only in Germany, uh, our startups generated three million revenues from Telefonica uh, alone. So I think uh, we started in the first year with uh, close to one million, and now it became three million. So I think the business model is is working, and the startups are are, are profiting from from it. Um, yeah, and I mean we are working with lots of startups. We have more than five hundred startups in our portfolio. And um, more than 140, I think, yes, uh, are working with Telefonica already, which I think is great. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if there are lots of corporations working with uh, so many startups at the same time out there. Yeah, truly some, some very great metrics. And I mean, revenue at the end of the day is what keeps the company alive and what helps, us to, helps it to grow. So I think that's also a very, very impressive metric that you can, that you can show there. Um, so you've you've spoken a lot about in the the numbers itself and 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 sort of what is behind it. Maybe you there's one of the startups or a couple of startups that you wanted to highlight uh, within the current uh, via Germany portfolio or success story success stories in general um, that sort of made use of of the USP that you delivered to those companies. Um, of course, I don't know. Uh, so I, I, I can tell you, I don't know. So the numbers, I, I, I won't be able to tell you, but of course I can mention you the startups. So um, since I started at Waira, uh, we started to invest with this new business model um, and we invested already in five companies. Uh, the five companies are uh, Motion Tag in, uh, in the, working in mobility space, Stack fuel in the ed tech um, segment, Flexivan also in the network segment, Lana Labs in the enterprise segment, and Cobrainer in the HR segment. These five, and four out of these five uh, experience an exponential exponential growth on revenues from Telefonica since we invested. So I think um invest like the, getting the investment from wider or telefonica ventures um uh, really brings an impact to the to the growth of of these companies uh working with telefonica um and i think it's just it's just the beginning so we have seen very good results and we're looking forward to continue mm -hmm. great thank you for that um so basically this this leads me to to a point where i wanted to have a or to a point where we can have a little bit of a discussion as well and, and, and get some opinions out there. So um, just like Vira, we at Faraday also operate in different markets with different cultures. Vira, obviously a little bit more because you're also in, in, in Latin America uh, where, we're, where we as Faraday are more based in, in Europe. But obviously when you start to help companies to grow, not only to grow, but in, in different markets, but also the actual company to grow, there are challenges that they face. And, and one thing that I wanted to discuss with you was cultural challenges that uh, startups might face exactly when it comes to that uh, point of growing, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think this topic uh, is, 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 can take us hours to, to discuss. But um, so some of the challenges that I see is that sometimes the startups uh, are like, or not startups, but the, the founders of the startups are coming straight from university or research centers, and they lack uh, lots of skills like uh, leadership skills and so on, uh, which uh, if you put this on top of the new things that they have to do, like sales, fundraising, customer retention, and so on, it really becomes a challenge to really create an organization that can grow uh, healthy and dynamically. Um, another challenge that I see is um, keeping and finding the right people for the company. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, at the end, if you want to create a long-term success, it's about a commitment in, in, an, 
in an ad- identity. So in the values and the vision of the company and finding the, the people with the, that share these values is, is, I think, in my opinion, a, a challenge. Um, and also, um, this is a high, high growing er- environment, right? So uh, startups need to work super fast to, I don't know, um, get product market fit, um, work on their USPs, uh, differentiate from competitors, and so on. And um, I think with this, um, it's they, 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 they are experiencing lots of changes. They are producing, like there is a lack of structure and this can impact in the transparency between the team members and so on. So I think it's like finding the right structure in the company and adapt it to the different stages of, of the growth of the company um, is not easy. And uh, last but not least, I think for startups, startup founders, that work in the in the idea from the beginning and have been working for years on, on the company, um, it's super difficult sometimes to delegate and to um, let people take decisions, which at the end they will have to do it at some at some point if they really want to scale up. Um, so I think empowering uh, leadership and empowering um, ownership, it's uh, it's a challenge uh, at the beginning. But it's the best way, in my opinion, to create and to build a trusted environment, which will help the company in the long term a lot. Mm. But uh, I don't know. What do you think? Like you were Definitely. a founder. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, um, there's, there's maybe two things, two things to add that I've seen both from the founder perspective, but also from the investor perspective, which are, and, and you already touched on that, uh, which is human resources, which is HR. Um, because you as a founder obviously start with a very strong idea and conviction to do something, but to, to hire those people who can then translate your conviction, not only to also live your same conviction, but to translate it. Um, because the second that there is more than one or two hierarchies within a startup, hierarchy levels, uh, you as a founder basically have maybe five or six heads that you speak to, and they then all of a sudden have to pass that on to their six and their six and their 10 and 20. And all of a sudden there's 200 people underneath you. Um, mm-hmm. But you don't really talk to any of them anymore, except for those six. So I think that is a, that is a very, very big challenge. And it's, it's difficult to get there, but it is something that, that definitely can be learned. And which is something where investors will actually get involved with the company, which is why I also think that the business angels to a certain perspective are very, very important for, for young companies to, to actually learn how to do that and have a sparing to, to get into that um, mm-hmm. or, or to actually let go, as you said, you know, to be able to delegate. That is, that is one of the, the parts. And the second part, and this is something where still today, and, and it's, it's beaten up and down all the time about how, um, metrics and number driven you should be, OKRs, all these kind of things. Um, a lot of founders, and I include myself in that from, from when we started in the very beginning, you think you're numbers driven and you think you're metric driven, but you're not really because you don't have a clue on how to actually do it. You know, so <laughs> you, you start tracking some things in an Excel here and some, some things, another Excel there. But um, to actually the the... I'm going to call it the art of proper financial and metrics tracking is something where there's still a lot that needs to be done. And um, again, I think it's, it's very important to have mentors and investors in this um, who actually help you to set it up and who have the faith in you from the beginning to say, don't worry if it's not perfect now, but we'll make it, we'll start growing it over the next um, years that we actually work together in this. So mm-hmm. I think those are the two points that I would like to add to what, what you just said. Yeah, very interesting. I think the KPIs part or the metrics part, it's a, it's a very important part, not only for, for investors, but also for, for the company itself. So I think it's a great point. Definitely, definitely. Um, so we, we both touched on, on the human resources, on the leadership um, that usually the founders uh, bring into the game. Um, so 
maybe we can we can have a little chat about how the leadership style of a founder um, actually can have an impact on the culture and the growth of a company, both, and, and <laughs> this could be controversial, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, uh, leadership is a journey. So uh, I think um, there are, like you cannot learn a lot about leadership at the same time. But I think the first step for founders is first to know uh, to know themselves, like learn about yourself and what are your values, what are what do you want to achieve, what are, what are your limits, and then uh, after that, um, you can continue by uh, trying to master your emotions, but not only your emotions and uh, which are really important for the business, but also uh, try to to master the emotions of others. Um, in terms of understanding how your employees, how your co-founders uh, feel, how do they think and how do they behave so that you can better manage this, uh, this team and these people and, and kind of find the synergies between all team members to, to achieve the goals uh, uh, at the, uh, in the best way for everybody. And um, very important, in my opinion, in order to, to create uh, as much transparency as possible, is to be authentic, uh, is to be yourself. Uh, once you know yourself, you can be authentic to, to yourself and to your values. And with that, you can create a, a great culture. Uh, and uh, with this great culture, like Amazon yeah, Amazon did in, in the past, I think they created a, a very good recruiting uh, process. Uh, so you can create, once you, you know your values, you know, um, you know uh, more about your culture you can create uh, much more transparent processes and and yeah like startup processes that really represent your company mm -hmm. definitely yeah and maybe uh, one more point um, could be um, like as a leadership uh, practice I think is very recommendable to lead by example like not only telling people what what is best to do but uh, doing it yourself so that they can see that that uh, you are also committed and that that's really the, the the real thing to do and also this also helps to create this trusted environment that we mentioned um, today and i think that's that's it i think uh, for instance negative uh, negative practices in my opinion uh, are, for instance, uh, micromanagement uh, practices, which really decrease the level of trust. But I also understand sometimes founders, uh, and this is the topic we just discussed, like letting people take decisions, letting people uh, decide, decide by themselves. If you have been working on this project for five years uh, from the beginning, I think it's hard, but uh, I think it's something really founders need to avoid. Mm, definitely. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to, to touch upon a few of the things that you said, and I'm, I'm going to steal a few words or an acronym from, from a mentor that, that I've been having for the last years, and I'm very grateful to have him around. Um, but he talks about empathy, motivation, and autonomy. Um, so I think this is, like you said, leadership is nothing that you can really learn, but it's something that you, not, not at once at least, it's nothing that you read in a book although there's so many books about leadership. Um, yet the empathy part is exactly that of understanding your surroundings and, and reacting to those surroundings. So I think that is something that is crucial uh, when it comes to, to building the culture in the company. Um, motivation, I think, is, is, is enormous because especially looking back at last year, uh, I, I don't know how you experienced that at, at Vira and from your personal perspective, that you could really see the, the, the true and the good founders and the strong teams were those who from the very top kept on being motivated, motivating their team and um, sailed through this pandemic as good as they could, taking measures fast and leading by example, obviously. Um, and, and I think that separated a lot of the good from the, I'm not going to say bad, but not so good founders and teams. Um, so, so that is the, the motivational part and, and then autonomy, allowing your employees, your team, your co-founders 
to make mistakes. I think um, that is something that also from a, from a founder perspective, I think is, is a very, very great tool to, to actually let people make mistakes on their own because a mistake can actually turn out to be not a mistake, but a huge factor that brings your company to grow. And if it doesn't, it's a learning effect, both for you as a, as a leader, but also for the person that you work with. So I think there's a, it's a very, very complex topic and um, nevertheless so interesting and yeah. nothing that can be dealt with in, in let's say half an hour of a talk, but I would, I'm, I'm more than happy, happy to sort of look into this uh, and at another time in, in, in more depth, because I think we have a lot of ideas in common there as well that we can keep on exchanging on. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's a very interesting topic. What you said about tolerating mistakes, I think it's also, it's also a great point. I actually like making mistakes, but I only like to make mistakes, mis the same mistake once, because otherwise it's quite bad. <laughs> I completely agree with you on this. Um, <laughs> So maybe to, to round up, there's this one thing that I, I, I wanted to talk to you about, which is more of a, a personal thing to you. And, and I thought it was, it was very, very cool and important to mention it and, and hear a little bit about it from, from yourself, is that you started a, a social project uh, not too long ago, um, which is called Startups Aid. So we've speak, uh, spoken a little bit about the challenges and, and, and leadership styles and so forth. So what is this? new project about yeah thank you for bringing that up um a startup a startups aid uh, was born this year uh as i was defining my goals for 2021 as my personal goals i do that uh every every uh, january and uh, i wanted to do something for the community um uh, for the startup community for free and to help startups um, with my with my knowledge and expertise, so I decided to to start this project, which is um, uh, like right now I'm offering um, sessions with the startups, like two sessions per week, where I try to share with them my opinion on the fundraising process that they are following, on on giving them feedback on the fundraising documentation and, and so on. Uh, but in the future, I will also be um, organizing webinars uh, with uh, people from my network uh, on different topics, like not only fundraising. I think the, the first webinar is going to be about uh, growth marketing, uh, probably uh, end of April. So it's just uh, doing something for the community and helping others. But thank you for Great. bringing that up. Cool. I mean, I think that's, that's what we all live off, which is community and, and interconnecting. Um, so count me in if, if you need people to support you on that, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to do so. Um, and with that, I would, I would like to thank you very, very much for your time today, for, for all those exciting and very interesting insights on, on Vira Germany. And, um, I hope we, we see each other soon again in person for, for a drink or two in, in Munich. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.